<coughs> Excuse me. All right, well, this evening, as I've already mentioned, we're moving to the second test, the second challenge that our Lord Jesus gives uh, that is meant not only for those who actually know him, the disciples who were seated in front of him as he preached the sermon, but also the crowds that had also gathered around him. So the second one we find in uh, chapter 7 of Matthew's Gospel in verses 15 through 20. So would you listen to this as I would, uh, as I read it? Jesus says, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles are they. So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Again, may the Lord bless his word to our understanding this evening. Now, this morning, remember we saw that as Jesus is ending his sermon, he's issuing four challenges to his hearers, both to unbelievers and to believers. And of course, he's now issuing these challenges to us because we are the hearers of this particular sermon. Now, we saw already that he reminds us that there are the two paths, but only one of them leads to heaven. We need to look and make sure we're on the right path. That there are many, secondly, as we're going to see this evening, that claim to teach us the truth about this path, how to get on it, how to walk it, but many of them aren't actually doing that. Are we listening to those who are telling us the truth? Thirdly, that there are many who believe that they're actually on this narrow path, who really are on the broad path, and the challenge is, are we actually going to arrive in heaven? Are we actually walking the narrow path? And then fourthly, Jesus challenges us in the foundations. You know, we have a choice, either to build our lives upon the truth or to build them upon lies. And of course, only those lives built upon the truth are going to be able to stand uh, against the difficulties we're going to have to face in life as well as at the final judgment when we stand before the Lord. Now, we've already looked at the first, as I've mentioned, if we hope to inherit eternal life, we do have to go through the narrow door, the only door, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way to the Father, and we must live in the way that he calls us to live, even though the way is straight, and again, not just not curvy, but difficult. We will walk on this path because it is the only path we will want to walk on. Now tonight, we're going to look at the second challenge Jesus gives us, the second test, that there are many who claim to teach us about this path, who claim to teach the truth, how to find it, how to walk on it, but that's really not what they're doing. And the question is, are we listening to the right uh, teachers? Now again, uh, in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, we, we have some great examples of this. Uh, one I'm just going to mention quickly, another I want to read a little bit from. But remember when, uh, uh, his, he, even though uh, Bunyan already called the, the, the main character Christian when he was in the city of destruction, he was not yet a Christian. He's reading the book. He gets he awakened to the fact that he's in danger. The Lord sends evangelists to him. An evangelist tells him that he needs to go straight to the wicked gate and he needs to go in. But evangelist also warns him along the way, make sure you don't listen to any who would try to get you off the path. And the reason is that he wanted him to go to the narrow gate so that he might find the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we find one warning against false teachers that will try to keep us from coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. And certainly uh, that is what happened. As Christian was on his way, he met a false teacher, Mr. Worldly Wise Man, and he listened to him. Worldly wise men told him that he didn't need to go to the wicked gate. Instead, he should go to the town of morality and speak to Mr. Legality, who would tell him how to get rid of the burden that was on his back. And, of course, to do that, he had to climb Mount Sinai. 
In other words, worldly wise man was pointing him to the law of God in order to justify himself before God. He put him on the path of good works, and it almost destroyed him. Remember what the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians 3.10, for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. There are many false teachers, of course, that teach exactly that, that we need to be good enough to enter into heaven through our own good works. Now, once he reached the gate, goodwill, who was also very much concerned for him, wanted to make sure he wasn't misled by false teachers, so he exhorted him, he encouraged him, he told him it was absolutely necessary that he walk in the narrow way. Goodwill says to him in the book, Look, just ahead of you, do you see this narrow way and how it goes ahead of us? It was established by the patriarchs, prophets, Christ, and his apostles. It is as straight a way as it is possible to find. This is the way that you must go. Now, Christian was already concerned because on his way to the gate, he had been deceived and had turned out of the way. So he asked this question, but are there no turnings or windings or detours by means of which a stranger can lose his way? Goodwill says this, yes, there are many side paths that attach to this narrow way, and they are crooked and wide. But you must distinguish the right way from that which is wrong by observing that it is straight and narrow. You know, the interesting thing is when I drew this quote from the source that I did, he spelled straight incorrectly and made the same mistake. He's not saying it's not curvy. He's saying it is difficult. It's a difficult road. And that's one of the ways we can know that it's the right road. If it's easy, it's not the right road. Because in this road, there will be difficulties, there will be trials. Well, sadly, the same danger exists today. There are many teachers... And by the way, they're not just in the church, but they certainly are in the church. They are outside of the church as well, who are going to try to lead us away from the narrow door, from salvation by the grace of God through faith alone in the true Jesus Christ, and from the narrow path, from living the kind of life that the Lord actually calls us to live. And so Jesus says we need to be on our guard. Now, first, Jesus warns us against the reality of false prophets and the dangers that they present in verse 15. And by the way, when Jesus says this, obviously, he's not just um, you know, shooting the breeze, not blowing smoke, as it were. These words are substantial because they're true. And we need to listen to what he says. He says this, beware of, false, of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly are ravenous wolves. There are false prophets. Now, let's remember, first of all, what it is that, that prophets are, because I think it is important and to find out exactly what Jesus is talking about here. The prophets were God's spokesmen. They were his lawyers, the ones that would uh, prosecute, most often, his covenant lawsuits against the people with whom he was in covenant with. I mean, the pe God had made a covenant with his people. He told them what he wanted to do. He told them what he would do for them if they obeyed and what would happen to them if they didn't obey. And obviously, God's people didn't always obey. So he had to sing his prophets to them in order to remind them. Now, when he sent the prophets to them, they, they would do two different things. They would foretell... God's word, and they would uh, foretell what was going to happen in the future. Now, to foretell means that they came out to declare his will, to remind God's people what it is that was required of them, which was faith and, and obedience, to remind them what God promised them if they would obey, you know, turn around and go back in this direction, because if you do, there's going to be blessing. And what it is he threatened if they didn't obey, which is the curse that would fall on them. So in this sense, in their forthtelling God's will, they were essentially 
God's preachers and teachers to his people, although only on occasion. They weren't the regular, as it were, the regular supply, okay? But he would also send them to foretell or to reveal what God was going to do in the future, not only to prove that they actually were speaking for God, but also because God wanted to encourage them that even though they failed or would continue to fail, miserably fail, that God was still going to be faithful. He was still going to fulfill his promise. He was still going to send his son. He was still going to bring salvation through him. Now, it's this foretelling that we often think about when we think about prophets. You know, they're the ones who tell the future. But that's not really what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking more about their foretelling. His warning really has to do with, with both, you know, with those who would presume to foretell and to foretell in his name. But he primarily has in mind here the, the latter, the foretelling, those who come and claim to teach his truth. As a matter of fact, it's the same thing that Peter warns his readers against in his second letter. In chapter 2, verse 1, he writes this, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Now, when Jesus is saying this, the first thing we need to realize is he is talking about not so much those that tell the future, but those who come claiming to teach God's word. So the people that he has primarily in mind right here, the ones he's speaking to the disciples and the crowds about are the scribes and the Pharisees. They need to watch out for them. Now, we don't typically encounter scribes and Pharisees today, at least you know, as, we, as we think of them. They do exist, but they're not people we usually interact with. But we do of course, run into many people who share this, basically the same teaching that they do, which is a teaching of works, okay? That we must be good enough. We must do enough good works. We must perfect ourselves enough, overcome enough of our sins before God is going to accept us, before he will justify us and really give us a right to heaven. Now, who is it that teaches those kinds of things today? Well, I think, obviously, the Roman church probably comes closest to this, but they're not the only ones. The Jehovah's Witnesses. Really, every cult teaches works as the way of salvation. Jehovah's Witnesses believe you have to join their organization. You have to learn from their teachers. You need to go door to door and join with them in, in sharing the good news about just come work with us and you'll inherit the kingdom. Of course, they have many other problems. They deny the Trinity. They deny the deity of Christ. They deny salvation by grace through faith alone. Um, the, they're some, they are one of the groups we need to watch out for. Mormons teach salvation by works as well. Uh, they work their way to godhood. They, they teach a false god. The god they worship, they believe, used to be a man, a human being just like us, but who worked his way to godhood, and, and now he's the god of this particular world, and Jesus essentially is the same. It's a false god, a false Christ, a false way of salvation. We've had no lack of false teachers in the history of the church. There's no shortage of false teachers today, nor is there any shortage of those who actually claim to speak directly from God. Now, we understand that the prophetic gift in, in the sense of direct revelation from God, in the sense of foretelling of the future has come to an end. When the Bible was complete, that gift ceased. So we know when somebody comes to us and says, this is what the Lord says, we know not to listen to them. But we do still have to deal with the many people who come to us and who claim to teach from the Bible, but misrepresent what God is actually saying. Jesus tells us that we need to beware of them. We need to keep our eyes open. We need to be on our guard. Now, in a certain sense, we do need to be on our guard against anyone who teaches anything that is contrary to what the Spirit teaches us in the Word of God, who adds to what the Lord says, who takes away from what it says, who distorts the truth in any way,
Um, even if they happen to be sincere and well-meaning. As a matter of fact, the people who are sincere are perhaps the more dangerous ones. We need to remember that everything the Lord tells us in His Word is important, that we are warned against adding anything to it or subtracting anything from it. Remember the canonical curse at the end of the book of Revelation? If anyone adds to the words of this prophecy, the Lord will add to him the curses that are in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of this prophecy, the Lord will take away from him his name from uh, the book of life. We need to be careful not to add or subtract. We must believe everything the Lord says in his word. We need to obey all the commandments, everything he commands us in his word. We cannot simply pick and choose what we want to believe or what we want to do, what we'll accept and what we won't accept. Not only would this be to reject God's authority, but it would also be to redraw the map. I mean, God has given to us a map that leads to heaven. It would be to distort that to the point where we wouldn't even be able to tell where the path was any longer. So not only would it injure us, but it'll also injure anyone that we try to help if we happen to embrace ideas that aren't true. Now, that's particularly true if we get the gospel wrong. We need to be on our guard. And I do think it's primarily those that Jesus has in mind uh, in this particular warning, those who distort the gospel so, so much so as to actually destroy them, those who are not, not you know, well, mainly, purposely, perhaps trying to deceive us, but even if so, sincerely. Jesus says they come to us in sheep's clothing, which can mean the clothing of a prophet because prophets wore clothing made out of uh, goat's skin and so forth, but which more likely means they come to us in the guise or disguise of one who is pretending to be from God, who is pretending to be good, who acts like they want to help us and they're really concerned about us. Maybe they are but they don't have the truth. Jesus says, but inwardly, they're really ravenous wolves. They are trying to take advantage of us. Now, when I say that, can you think of anyone who fits the bill? Is there anybody out there trying to do that? Yeah, they're all over the television, actually. Now, there is nothing more dangerous to a sheep than a wolf. Jesus says they come in sheep's clothing, they're, but they're coming to God's sheep but inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. What he's telling us here, there's really nothing more dangerous to us than a false teacher. False teachers who try to lead us away from the truth purely for their own gain, to devour us. That is what the scribes and the Pharisees actually did, taking advantage of God's people. Plenty of indictments against them in the New Testament as well as in the Old Testament, how the shepherds of Israel were doing quite, quite well for themselves while the sheep were essentially suffering. They were taking advantage of the sheep for their own gain. And as I've said, there's no shortage of people who do that to us today. That's really what the prosperity movement is all about. It's not your prosperity, but it's their prosperity. Abundant living, uh, victorious living, all of these things that, that tickle the ear so that you'll buy into their ministry and they'll actually be able to experience what it is they're saying you can experience. We have to watch out for them as well as the JWs, Mormons, and others who would lead us astray. Now again, many of these might not be trying to deceive us. They may actually believe that what they're saying is true. The scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus' day, many of them actually believed that what they were doing was the right thing to do. If you were to ask Paul when he was on his way to Damascus to arrest Christians and to drag them back to Jerusalem, whether he was doing the right thing, he would have said, yes, that he was doing God's will. Uh, the Roman church would have said that they were doing God's will when they burned Tyndale and Huss and Cranmer at the stake. You see, it's, we're not saying that they're necessarily insincere, but what we are saying is it doesn't matter whether they're sincere or not, they're still dangerous. And so we need to be on our guard because what they believe, what they teach, can actually destroy us. Now, secondly, Jesus tells us how to recognize them in verses 16 through 18 and in verse 20. He says, you will know them by their fruits. 
Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. So then you will know them by their fruits. You know, again, here Jesus is teaching in the way he normally teaches. He's drawing an analogy from what people see on a daily basis to spiritual truths that they can't necessarily see unless illustrated perhaps in this way. But what he's saying is that every fruit tree or vine is going to produce fruit according to the kind of tree or vine that it is. I mean, every year when Dick is growing cherries uh, on the cherry trees or when he's cultivating these trees, he's expecting to see cherries because they are cherry trees. He's not expecting to see figs or other things like that. A tree or a vine is going to produce uh, the kind of fruit according to the, the particular kind of tree or vine that it is. Now, if you know what it is, you can know what to expect from it. But if you don't know what kind of tree it is, you'll have to wait and see what it actually produces. And that is the case, of course, here with these teachers. You don't know, so you look and you see. Now, if the tree is a good tree, Jesus says it will produce good fruit. And we'll look at what that fruit is in a moment. But if the tree is bad, it will produce bad fruit. Now, Jesus goes on to say that it can't be otherwise a good tree can't produce bad fruit. Now, he's not saying here, and perhaps you know, we've been confused by this kind of language because in a certain sense, this idea of bearing fruit and being a good or bad tree also applies to us, doesn't it? Some, it sounds like Jesus is saying here that if you're a good tree, you can't actually do anything wrong. But that's not what he's telling us here. He doesn't mean the tree's perfect. He doesn't mean that it's never going to do anything that's wrong or teach anything that's wrong. But what he is saying is a good tree cannot continually produce bad fruit. There will be some bad fruit, but it's not going to be the pattern of our lives or the lives of these teachers who are good teachers, a good tree, to produce bad fruit. They are going to consistently produce good fruit. The one who is born of God practices righteousness, okay? And he also says a bad tree can't produce good fruit. And by that, he doesn't mean that a bad tree will never appear to produce good fruit but that it will not produce that fruit consistently, good fruit consistently, because it's a bad tree. It will produce bad fruit consistently. So now, how do we use this to identify the false teacher? Well, Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. We need to examine their fruit. Now, there's at least three kinds of fruit that we can look for, and I think the first one is the main one, teaching, that lines up with Scripture. Secondly, a life that is consistent with that teaching. And then thirdly, the potential of their teaching to produce this same kind of influence on their hearers, and that really has to do with teaching the truth again. Okay. The most obvious way to recognize a false teacher is to compare what they say with Scripture. Now, in order to do this, you know, the, the tendency would be, and some have done this, just dive into books on false teaching, books on the cults, read about them, study them, learn everything they have to teach, and that's how you'll recognize it is that when you hear somebody saying it, then you'll have read it and that's how you'll know it. Well, the fact is we don't have to do that. We don't have to do an exhaustive study on everything or anything a false teacher has taught or might, te might teach to be able to recognize them, all we need to do is study the Bible. That's really what we ought to do. I've, I know people who have studied the cults and have actually gone into the cults because of that. They weren't in the word. They were in the error. We need to be in the truth, not in the lie. Uh, the best way to recognize a counterfeit bill is to study a genuine bill, the genuine article, until we know it, until we recognize it. The best way to recognize false teaching is to study the truth until we know it, until we know it thoroughly. If you know the truth, you'll immediately recognize when you hear something that isn't true. The reason why Luke commended the Jews in Berea was because they were committed to doing this very thing. He writes in Acts 17.11, 
Now, these, these Jews that he was ministering to in Berea, these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. And the thing that I think is remarkable about this is the fact that uh, the one who was bringing the word to them was the Apostle Paul. And they didn't take his word for it, but they looked in the word of God to make sure that it lined up with what God said. That's what we need to do. Paul exhorted those who, who believed in the Lord Jesus in Thessalonica, there were some who did, to do the same thing. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 19 through 21, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Now, teachers that are good teachers, they'll have God's Holy Spirit in them. They will be guided by Him. They will never continually bear bad fruit. They won't knowingly teach or maintain anything that they know to be false. They may get some things wrong, but they will get the things that are fundamental to the gospel right. They will point us to the right door. They will point us to Jesus as the way of salvation. They will guide us in the right path, the narrow path. Jesus says a good tree will bear good fruit. And what he means by this is continually bear fruit. Not perfect, but, but that will be the, the pattern of their lives as it is every believer as far as living the Christian life. Now, false teachers that don't have God's Spirit, they may get some things right, but they won't be able consistently to teach the truth. They will point us away from Jesus as our only hope of salvation. Their teaching will broaden the road, tend to broaden the narrow path to the point where it's really going to be indistinguishable from the true broad path. A, bear, uh, excuse me, a bad tree will bear bad fruit. So the first test is examine what the teachers are teaching because a lot of people teach a lot of things. And, you know, we have to also have to be careful of not just people who are teachers, but even people who, you know, are, are other professing Christians or people who are just sharing what they believe to be true. We can still influence one another in a bad way that way. We need to make sure that we're always speaking the truth and that we're, when we listen, that we're listening for the truth and judging everything we hear by the truth and not just accepting anything out of hand. Now, the next thing we can look for is whether or not their lives are consistent with their teaching. Good teachers, if they're good, if they have the Spirit of God in them, will follow the truth. And in following the truth, they will become like the Lord Jesus. They, their lives aren't going to be shrouded in scandal. They're not going to be involved in dubious activities. They're going to reflect the image and nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, false teachers might be able to cover their true nature for a while, but not forever. It'll eventually be revealed. It'll eventually show up. And I think we have many examples of that as well. And then the third thing to look for is, is what they're teaching produces in others. And we have to be careful here because they can't make that happen. Um, it needs to have that influence. Does it have the tendency to uh, motivate people and to push people towards Christ-likeness? Or does it have the tendency to make them more worldly? Now, again, that, as I've said, has to do with, with their influence, the influence of their teaching, and not exactly what happens in our lives because teachers can teach the truth, but, you know, that, that God actually intends to move us in the right way, but it might not have that effect. The Spirit needs also to be at work. But the fact is, bad teaching never produces holiness. It doesn't have that tendency. It has a tendency to produce further sin and worldliness. So the question is, what does their teaching tend towards? Worldliness or holiness? So Jesus says we can recognize a false teacher by their teaching. We can recognize a false teacher by the effect that their, their belief system has on themselves, as well as the way that it tends to influence other people. What are the tendencies of that teaching? Because Jesus tells us that the good teacher, the true teacher, is going to be encouraging 
God's people towards holiness. Now, finally, he tells us why we should be on our guard against false teachers in verse 19, where he says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, Jesus here may be talking mainly about false teachers, but he's not talking about them exclusively because if we listen to false teachers, then we're going to end up doing the same thing that, that they do. And so our end will be the same as theirs. Uh, Jesus actually gives us a very similar warning, a similar warning to his disciples uh, in John 15, verse 2 and verses 5 and 6. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears fruit much fruit, and the implication or the, uh, is here, of course, good fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, which means he's not going to bear fruit, can be barren, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Do you remember the instance where Jesus is, is going out of Jerusalem in the morning, actually, he's coming into Jerusalem and he sees a fig tree and he goes to the tree to, to find fruit on it. There's no fruit. He says, no longer will there be any fruit on you uh, from, from now on, okay? And so then there's two different accounts. It either withers right away, uh, which is sort of a conflated account, sort of condensed, or the one where Jesus leaves. Again, Jerusalem comes back the next day. The disciples look at the tree and they say, how is this tree withered? From, from the roots up, what, what happened to the tree? And, and it stands as a warning, doesn't it? A warning to us, a warning to Israel in particular, that Jesus has come looking for fruit year after year after year, and they're not bearing any fruit, and so they're close to being cursed, and that's exactly what happened after the Lord gathered his people out of Israel. But we have these images again and again of the importance of bearing fruit and bearing good fruit. Jesus says here, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. If we listen to these false teachers and they are successful in deceiving us, if they turn us away from Jesus, you know, there are, you know where the Jehovah's Witnesses get their people? They, they prey on Trinitarian believers who really are not grounded in the truth and perhaps not converted, and they deceive them, and they become a part of their organization. That's where they come from. Well, sometimes they're successful in drawing those who profess the faith away. And if they turn us away from Jesus, and certainly Jehovah's Witnesses do that, as our only hope of salvation, as the Judaizers were trying to do to the Galatians, as every one of these groups that teaches works for justification, or even those that would encourage us who are atheists that all of this is just a fiction. I mean, any of these people could turn us away if, if they're successful. And if they are successful in leading us onto the broad road, you know, the broad road that basically says anything goes, you can live the way you want to live, as followers of easy believism actually teach in the church today, or the contemporary evangelical church that is continually downgrading holiness and the standard of God to the point where everyone essentially becomes a Christian, if we buy into this, we can end up being destroyed, okay? We have to walk, we have to go through the narrow gate, we have to walk on the narrow path. That's the only way we'll be saved. I'm not saying, of course, that every broad evangelical church is obviously teaching these things. There are many that aren't, but that's the tendency. It's going on now. Things are continually, uh, they're lowering, as it were, the standard. And what is the standard that God actually gives us in his word? What is it that makes the, the past so difficult? The standard is actually perfection. And it's hard to downplay perfection. Now, we do need to understand the good news is this, that this will never happen to us. We will never be deceived by these false teachers and be led away from Christ onto the road and be destroyed, we won't because we, by God's grace, will listen to what Jesus is actually warning us to do here. 
And we will be on our guard against false teachers, and we won't listen to them. Or if we happen to be deceived by them, he will not allow us to be deceived for very long. We will not fall away from the Lord. But this could happen to us if we don't truly believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, as it has happened to so many people who have been deceived by Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons out of a Christian church into a cult. So we need to make sure we're listening to the warning that Jesus gives to us here. If you're trusting Jesus and turning from your sins and listening to him, he will make sure that you stay on the right path. So Jesus' warning to us this evening is be on your guard. Beware of false prophets. Thomas Brooks wrote a whole book about this. I mean, these false prophets, they have somebody behind them. His name is Satan. And Satan appears as an angel of light to deceive, and they do as well because they are his messengers. And Satan is a very good fisherman, and he knows exactly what kind of bait to use for us. We need to be on our guard against all of these different ways that the enemy may try to deceive us. So listen again to what Jesus says. Hold fast to him. Hold fast to his word. Be in his word so you understand it, so you know what he says, so you recognize the false teaching when it comes your way, and you will be, by his grace, safe. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to um, just help us sort through our own belief system to make sure that we are listening to the truth, that we are grounded in the word of God. It is the only safe way for us.